Hi. I want to thank everyone for being here. I want to thank the conference organizers. It's a delight to be here. I'm excited to be presenting. Um, my paper is about outrage. So, um, go ahead, bite the big apple. Don't mind the morals. Rarit, digitality, and moralism. At the end of 2014, Slate published a large piece about public and social media outrage. It included numerous short columns, plus, as a coup de grace, a calendar of 365 click-throughs describing an outrage for every day of 2014 outrage is every day. I don't even need to tell you about it. Outrage drives our media rhythms. Hashtag Indiana religious freedom is just the latest in an endless series of waves. The news cycle frilled with the latest scandal and all the moral tribes falling into position to hem their haw and ground their stomp. Those of a cynical cast might suggest that we need outrage, if only to cut through the fogs of media bloviation. There's possibly a truth here, and that outrage isn't just irrepressible, but indispensable, a point I'll come back to. But the spectacle of outrage has generated speculation about what causes it and how we are to think and feel about it. Certainly it circulates in highly tailored forms designed to maximize impact, to captivate us, enrage us, incite us to share, bicker, revile. Media columns, tweets, and status updates spread the bag of strong hate love and spark the commentary where people queue up for a go in the pecking parties or volcano with the idea that someone somewhere might have different ideas. Much of this malto meal vitriol saddens me, not because of the bow tie sets grousing about the loss of public reasonableness, but rather because of the respect degree zero for Disoy Logoi's greatness. Certainly too, many of the outrages are serious, but just as often they are ridiculous. There is a world of difference between, say, the Ferguson protests, and we might actually hope for some productive change there, and some NASA plowboy wearing a shirt with bikini-clad women on it. But in terms of the outrage, the formal media mechanisms seem much the same. Big media overkills it, and in social media, one raises one's moral battle flag and clicks and spews out for the great miasmic spectacle. Pundits and public intellectuals tell us that the endless cycle of outrage is the, is the connectivity that splits us asunder, funneling us into opposing political camps. Such public spit spatting elevates conflict at the expense of needed social solidarity, even or especially when the outrage is genuinely outrageous. Not all are so pessimistic, of course. Others, such as Manuel Castells, argue that these networks of outrage can also be networks of hope in the Arab Spring, the Arab Spring being an iconic example. Despite the complexities, Castells argues, here we see how networks of outrage function to inspire hope and courage, even in the face of terribly violent repression. Despite the appearance of positive examples, however, at the everyday level, the pyrotechnics tend to substitute for real political action, as Jody Dean argues. Via Guy de Debord, she argues that media guarantee, quote, a kind of eternity of noisy insignificance. Further, such communicative debacle debases itself into new enjoyments of aggression towards the other, such as like a global hate-in. Thus, for instance, the punch-counterpunch that fixates on some poor, poor flashpoint figure the latest such example is the Indiana pizza parlor that claimed it would not cater pizza for a gay wedding. First, leftists pounced, rocking the business on its heels until rightists rallied by donating 800 million to their cause. And so it goes. Meanwhile, it is also undeniable that this new discursive form and its cutthroat delicacies are a poke in the eye to the media elites, typically white and male, of course, who want to tell us all how we should argue. Outrage on this view may just be the price for heretofore silenced voices finding purchase in their own idioms. 
All this quick hit, that's good, that's bad, run through is fun. It's not what I'm here for today. I'm simultaneously fascinated and repelled by this media eruption of Moore's, but I'm also concerned with what this suggests for rhetorical theory, and specifically the possibilities we still claim for a general rhetoric. By a general rhetoric, I mean one that is endlessly applicable and transportable, a methodology. It takes many forms, whack and wid programs predicated on the idea that writing is adaptable anywhere. It manifests in the idea that everything's an argument. It's already explicitly articulated by the ancient Greeks who seek a general theory of persuasion and language, such as locating the art and the ability to find the available means of persuasion. The debates about big rhetoric stem from the expansiveness inherent in its generality. We also see it in the endless list of rhetorics of X. But the point I want to make today is that the circulation of outrage stains this dream. Rhetoric cannot be general. We have glimpses of this already when we see students decline to investigate opposing sources or simply refuse to be an audience that can listen and be swayed. But such symptomatic glimmers are typically swept under the pedagogical rug since that's, the one of the, since that's one of the rugs tying the rhetorical room together. But media outrage seems unsweepable. I wager that all this moral slinging and shotting urges us to look again at generality as a rhetorical problem. If we step into the Wayback Machine, we might recall that the 1980s entrance of postmodernism into rhetorical theory had already levied doubts about rhetoric's transparency and generalizability. James Berlin was one of the first to argue explicitly that rhetoric was ideological first and always. Indeed, shortly before his death, Berlin admitted in a review of Marshall Alcorn's essay in progress that this not only counts, constituted his difference with Alcorn, but also his newfound research interest in Lacan. He wanted to further investigate the affective underpinnings of human being as a way of determining why ideological investments were so powerful. But the problem that quickly emerged for Berlin and others was twofold. First, given the emphasis on ideology, pedagogical orientation quickly became one of rooting out pernicious beliefs. We fondly look upon this enterprise as the culture wars. Rhetoric's ideological nature was relegated, relegated in the field itself to bad pedagogies, such as expressivism. However, for those on the cultural studies mission of reprogramming students, especially the right-wing right ones, rhetoric remained either curiously neutral or even good, as opposed to the bad rhetorics of the conservative other. One wonders about this blindness, especially given how tribal it seems in retrospect. It was as if bad rhetorics in the end were simply an oppressive, prejudicial, and typically conservative stain that could be cleansed with cult studs brand detergent. Second, the theories of ideology on hand could certainly chart the power of affective investments, especially as it tended to produce substantial resistance in the classroom. But trying to provide deeper, richer explanations for it was difficult. Partly this inheres in the very name and discourse of ideology, which focuses on idea-driven beliefs. Affective investments are supportive of something linguistic first, even if irrational. Those who remained unimpressed by ideology critiques, such as Victor Vitanza, began opening up other theoretical venues, such as Leotard's notion of a libidinal economy. And a good number of feminist thinkers had long been making the point that emotion could not be neglected, indicated also by turns away from ideology per se to the body. Perhaps unsurprisingly, it was this kind of work that pointed a way forward, because contemporary advances in neuroscience, cognition, and psychology suggests that our emotional and moral selves are primary. Yet the project for a general rhetoric remains alive in new materialist, post-human, communitarian, digital, and other rhetorical approaches. We see it in all those who see rhetoric as prior to the symbolic or inherent in the material or technological. I see it at work in my own writing. If the ambient rhetoric I have sought to theorize precedes the human and is materially entangled, it must then take, mark, take part in some measure of generality. My thought now is that while this is an advance, it cannot be a resting point. The anger cycles of outrage are useful for putting us back into the germinal mindset of Berlin. 
that rhetoric cannot in any simple general sense be prior, prior to articulation, to the symbolic or to the human. But if rhetoric cannot be general, and if it's not ideology exactly, then what are we talking about? In terms of rhetoric's a priori effectability, that is how rhetoric might be said to pre-exist the human, I can't address that today. But in terms of a post-human rhetoric within the digital locus, I have a few hypotheses. First, as stated perhaps most explicitly in the work of Jonathan Haidt, human beings are, in a word, righteous. We are drunk with moral judgment. One of his recurrent motifs for describing how this works is the image of the elephant and the rider. The elephant corresponds to our emotional moral thinking, the rider to the rational. What Haidt claims is that rationality is primarily responsive to the elephant. That is, rationality rarely decides, but rather justifies or rationalizes why it was reasonable to head where the elephant leaned. A classic example of this idea at work is neuroscientist Antonio Damasio's case of Phineas Gage, a brain damaged victim who lost emotional cognitive ability and reputedly became an unfeeling, indecisive, but calculating nightmare. In Haidt's terms, the rational rider unleashed from the elephant achieves not Neoplatonist nirvana, but psychopathic gear grinding. Digital media do not make some radical break with other forms of human interaction or with rhetoricity. Nevertheless, the material affordances of digital forms achieve their specific contours, opening vectors for the virulent spread of content and presenting such content, not to the Burkean parlor, but to the digital world Petri dish filled with friends, acquaintances, strangers, and an obscure network of commentianders. It's like high school metastasized for the whole world, a demonic tweet rave a spew in Plato's cave. It could be easy to shift from outrage to social observer to plain old cynicism. But the deeper insight Height and company have is that no matter the stance, moral cognition pulsing to emotional rhythms suffuses all our thoughts and actions. Nietzsche was the great diagnostician of the irrepressibility of moralism, finding it in asceticism, stoicism, philosophy, science, everywhere. Science has its moderations, but who can fail to see that all scientific matters eventually come to moral issue? Climate change moralizes on all points of human life and how to live it, a recognition whose obviousness the right exploits with real glee. Meanwhile, climate changes they spewed, I spewed, media heat itself melts polar ice. Digital media's specificity, then, is to pull out and contour differently capacities already inherent in all rhetorics. What the phenomenon of outrage does is push us back into the now fallow debates about rhetoric's fundamental ideologicalness. But rather than ideology, outrage showcases our irrepressible being moral. We're moral rotters without the decency to cop to it. Even putting it like this makes me feel like a finger wagging scold. This isn't to say, of course, that moralism is simply prior to rhetoric, but it is to say that the advent of the post-human for which digital rhetoric's role is profound demonstrates that there is no evacuation of the moral strands entwined in rhetoric's DNA. The fact that it's not just ideology actually intensifies the issue. Richard Lanham once argued that rhetoric could not be divided up into good or bad rhetorics, advocating a strong defense that held all virtuoso rhetorics to be some evidence of virtue. Nothing is good or bad until the judge renders the decision. A wondrous argument, but perhaps flawed in that it miscalculates on Plato. Lanham assumes that the axis of the problem resides in the achievement of decisive knowledge being the source of virtue. But in so doing, he misses the deeper problem Plato presents, which is how Plato outsophists the sophists while masquerading as a truth besotten prig Lanham, that is, underestimates rhetoric's elephant in the room, finding the performance already proof enough. But Gorgias knew. After reading Plato's dialogue about him, Gorgias reputedly laughed. What a fine ironist Plato is. Put differently, disoi logoi is neither amoral nor transmoral. Rather, the rejection of both these forms of rhetorical generality. It is a second order morality one entangled in the necessity of the other and the spiraling techniques of language and cognition. 
As such then, post-human rhetorics, such as studies of digitality, present us with the problem of developing a post-human understanding of moralism and its fevers. It must take seriously that this affective moralism reaches down into the crevices of the human biocog and rhetoric too. The pretense that rhetoric merrily enables or democratizes is the epitome of Nietzsche's lament about bad air. Consider how the escalating forms of digital segmentation, variously called siloing, the new narcissism or digital autism, make the case that the material techniques, algorithms, and forces of digitality amount to a global sorting hat, putting us in our respective houses, which is also to say our moral tribes. But as Haidt and others show, moral tribalism amounts to the same thing, being a bind and blind activity. Inculcation in our houses of the holy automatically renders other houses problematic. Digitality simply adds new permutations. As technology further externalizes what was formerly interior to the self, both willingly and unwillingly, we confront a new facet of the post-human techno-self. This goes beyond Andy Clark's ongoing plastic mergers with the material world to confront the pulsatingly righteous wrath children screaming through Philaware, Pragacago, and beyond. The fact that, as many such as Frank Pasquale argue, interactive algorithms, data points, surveillance, and other non-human ambient phenomena shape our lives, such as the Facebook manipulation experiment that got everybody down, does nothing to dispel the conundrum of morality. It simply drags it finger wagging into the post-human thunderdome. Pascal's claim that we need breaks from the algorithmic tools manipulating us for obscure purposes, it seems to me, is precisely the wrong idea. Wrong because it's impossible in the terms given. It amounts to some attempt to shelter a notion of the human. Bad culture, bad algorithms, different spin cycle, same detergent. A moral judgment, masquerading as a general framework, preserving us in the face of the bad thing. If rhetoric can never be general, being always already an exaptation from moral bearings, subject to flare-ups on the grill of everyday interaction, we might still ask if within its methodological spectrum it has its own algorithms. From this perspective, rhetoric has never not been post-human. This is why rhetoric only merges with the other who one must reach. If there were no gap, no difference, there would be no rhetoric. While outrage symptomizes the effect of the digital in new tribalisms and siloing, or the privileging and power and secrecy of some networks and forces over others, rhetoric's machinic reach for the other remains, testing these boundaries like Jurassic Park velociraptors testing the fence line. Let me close then on a perfectly traditional rhetorical text that may still retain surprising subversiveness, Cicero's On the Ideal Orator. In a lengthy, if not wearying dialogue, Cicero expounds on what makes an orator great, going through the canons, the uses and disuses of philosophy and so on. What is interesting here is how these strands come together. On the one hand, we have Greek wisdom, exemplified in philosophy, which amounts to a rationalized intensification of the Mediterranean basin wisdom traditions. Walter Burkert, Burkert calls this whole development from Sumer to Greece, the optimism of the Lagos, that it's useful to know things. But on the other hand, the narrowly understood raw power of persuasion betrays something else. It is useful to recall that Roman society was corrupt and violent, far worse than ours. The need for the perfect orator went hand in hand with the need to confront the forces of violence and tyranny. Good orators were the last best hope for preserving the Republic's mixed constitution. What was needed was not less argument and less outrage, but more and better, an oratorical arms race. All the mud and the blood and the wine amounted to an endless push to outmanipulate the other. But this drive to Trump at all costs itself came from a deeper seated belief in rhetoric's prime directive to reach out, even if to trick, manipulate, seduce, flatter. It is, by any count, a mess, a mess of logoi. And this clash of the logoi is not grounded rationally, but morally. And this is where I end. The combination of digitality and the eruption of outrage is one trajectory for post-human moralisms. 
And rather than being an impediment to rhetoric, even considered in its most craven forms, it is its own best argument for more. Rhetoric's riffraffery then is finally an optimism of the shitstorm, that it is useful to thrash things out, even as things in turn thrash us. The impossibility of a general rhetoric, which is to say its irrepressible moral stain, asks not, as Pasquale and the other critical watchdogs of the digital world have it, to find some respite. Rather, it asks, much like Lacan suggests, to double down on what appears the worst. Moral righteousness signposts the beginnings of a post-human moral frame yet to come, perhaps. We are all participants in these experiments of the digital enlightenment. Emergent transhuman phenomena in here in all rhetoricity, latent and activated, inseparable from the moral current that bears us together and apart. The sling arrows of outrage are just the biggest waves marking the roiling of hope around us, even if we fight about it. Thank you.